Today is a very big day for us here at Capital. And by the way, I want to welcome everybody watching online. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you need prayer, there's someone there to pray with you. Wherever you are, we just want you to know we love you. And we're glad you're tuning in today. But today, we're having our very first Solid Rock Ranch Benefit Banquet. Now, you, you have to understand our history and our journey of what God has done over the last 26 years of doing Solid Rock Ranch. It has just been amazing. But here's what I want to say. There's so many people that have stepped up, businesses that have stepped up, individuals have stepped up. There's nearly 50 sponsors that are helping us pull this banquet off ton of volunteers that have been serving and laboring. I'm just I'm just standing back in awe. Have you ever been like really excited about doing something that hasn't happened yet? I feel like a kid going to Disneyland. Is that okay? Come on, somebody. I'm fired up. So I just want to say to the team, those of you that have partnered, those that are your sponsoring and being a part of this, thank you so much. And then next week, next week, uh, we continue on with our summer here at Capitol, and that's with our Solid Walk Ranch event itself. And we talk a lot about it because the reason we do that, it's one of the signature things that we do here. How I many know you can do a lot of things and do them shallow, but you can do a few things and do them more deeply? Solid Rock Ranch is one of the things that we try to do deep that involves our church. We ask for people to serve. We ask for people to volunteer. The students come out. And it's amazing what God does in the students, but you know what's also amazing? It's what God does in those who serve. And there's a couple serving opportunities that are still left. If you've been praying about it, thinking about it, we need just a few more counselors. As we're coming back out of COVID, this is the first year we've been challenged a little bit with uh, our, our volunteer needs. The financial needs are being met, but the volunteer needs are still a little light. So if you want to partner with us, and this is a part of our philosophy here, because we're always wanting our church not just to sit and learn, but to learn and do. Because we're changed by not what we learn, we're changed by what we do and so this is one of those serving opportunities and and you're saying but pastor i've got to work i got an idea for you try this i've seen it work many times go to your employer tell them you need the week off paid and you might find out i've seen it happen over and over it's like you know what i got a heart for kids i can sponsor i can get behind something like that and you might be amazed at how many employers would pay you to be there for the week while you make an investment uh, yeah, and then and then see who's laughing on the way out. It's like I got blessed. I'm gonna go serve Jesus and get paid for it. Come on, somebody. So I got this question for you. I want to I want to I want to continue this subject we've been talking about. Something God really stirred in my spirit a couple of weeks ago, and that's what legacy are you leaving? I was teaching a couple of weeks ago on Father's Day actually, and I read this verse in Psalms 145, and it says, "One generation, one generation, one generation." shall praise your works to another generation. How many know there are multiple generations? And, 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 and as one generation is emerging, one generation is thriving, and one generation is exiting. We don't like the exiting part, do we? <laughs> but it, it's, it's the journey of life. But before we exit, the Bible says we want to declare to the emerging generation or the generations that are following us, we want to declare the praises of our God. We want to make his mighty deeds known. So the question becomes this, what legacy will you and I leave behind? What legacy will I individually leave behind? You individually? What legacy will we as a church leave behind? Because we will leave it all behind. The question is, will anybody find it? Come on, somebody. Will anybody even know what it is? We can leave possessions. We can leave properties. We can leave assets. We can leave houses. We can leave a lot of wonderful, wonderful inheritance. But the greatest legacy that you and I can leave behind is a spiritual legacy. The greatest thing that you and I can leave behind is our spiritual legacy. And a leg spiritual legacy is passed on through impartation. Impartation, watch this, impartation is simply the act of passing on what I have, what I know, what I've learned, my wisdom. It's the act of, the action of actively trying to pass on, pass it on, because you can't pass it on after you're gone. You have to pass it on while you're alive. 
And it's the active passing on of what I know, what I've learned, what wisdom I might have gained, and it's the attempt to pass it on. And the Bible calls this impartation or this passing on making disciples. And here's what I want you to understand today. If you call yourself a Christian, if you say, I am a follower of Jesus, then you need to understand that as a follower of Jesus, I need to understand as a follower of Jesus, that you and I are called to go and make disciples. We are called. We are commissioned. This is our assignment to go and make disciples. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 28. In Matthew 28, he's, he's risen from the dead. He's in front of his disciples. Try to get in the context of this moment. He, he, they have seen him go to the cross. They've seen him brutally die. They've talked to him after he's risen from the dead. So they have, they clearly understand who he is. They clearly understand his power because it's been demonstrated. And he says to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Here's what he's saying. You know who I am. You know what I can do. Therefore, go into all nations and make disciples. He goes on to say, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That means get them incorporated into God's family. Teach them all things I've commanded you. That means mentor them. And lo, I am with you always. Here's what he's saying. You have this assignment to go. Gather them into my family. Teach them how to be my family. And as you go, I will be with you. And God has been with generation after generation after generation who accept that assignment. 2,000 years ago, even though he departed and went to heaven, he gave us his spirit, and his spirit has been helping pass the baton from generation to generation to generation. And if you and I get the understanding that God wants us to go and make, he's going to go with us. So when I talk to you about going and making, I want you to know God doesn't want you to go alone. He'll go with us. He'll go with us in the making of disciples. When I say making of disciples, it's I want to impart something to you. I want to add something to you that's going to cause your life to have greater value. How many know that if you and I pass the baton effectively, we're putting into the hands of the next generation something that's going to add value to their life. If I leave a spiritual legacy to the next generation, I'm passing the baton that adds value to their life. And so this passage of Scripture that I'm reading to you, we call it the Great Commission, not the Great Suggestion. You know, like some of us, we read the Bible, and the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the one we call Lord, Master, and Savior, Jesus, we take His instructions and we consider them suggestions. But if He truly is the King of Kings, He said, all authority has been given to me, he was not giving them, he was not giving them a suggestion. He was giving them a commission. He was giving them a directive. He's giving them a mission. In other words, it was their marching orders. Now here at Capitol, we get a lot of soldiers that come through here. And every once in a while, like last week, I was meeting some different soldiers. They were telling me, Pastor, we got our orders. Where are you going? We're going to Virginia. I'm always hearing of soldiers who are getting their orders. They're men and women under authority. When they get their orders, it doesn't really matter how they feel about it. It doesn't really matter if they want to do it or not. It doesn't really matter if they're going to cry over it. It just means, are you going to fulfill your orders? That's why soldiers make such great Christians. <laughs> Come on, somebody. They understand, no, they understand how to be under authority and you and I whether we want to recognize it or not we are under the lordship's authority if you call Jesus lord if you confess yourself as a Christian we're under his lordship and his lordship has directed us to pass the baton to the next generation he says go and make cake he didn't say go and make a cake he didn't say go and make a name for yourself. Go and build your career. Go and build a great life.
Go and prosper. Go and pursue happiness. Go and build something wonderful. Nothing wrong with any of those things. Here's what he's saying. As you're on your way to build your life, don't forget, along the way, make disciples of all people you encounter. As you're building your career, don't forget you have an assignment to make disciples. As you're pursuing and building your family, don't forget to build and grow and make disciples. Don't forget to pass the baton. So what is a disciple? If I'm supposed to make something, be nice to know what it is. I'm trying to make, right? See, what it says, go and make disciples. There's two parts here. There's the disciple and the disciple maker. A disciple is simply someone who is a fully devoted follower of Christ. And this is where we're helping someone. Listen carefully. This is, if, if I'm going to be the disciple maker or I'm going to be the disciple, the disciple is someone who's making the transition from passive Christianity to passionate Christianity. They're making the transition from casual Christianity to becoming a Christian with a cause. Do you know I'm trying to get you to be a Christian with a cause? I know people sometimes, I don't want to go to that church. They're always trying to get me to do something. Right. Trying to make disciples, not church attenders. Jesus didn't say go make church attenders. He said go make disciples. I know. Take, take, take those who are indifferent, indifferent Christians and rise them up and cause them to shift over to become Christians who make a difference. Come on, somebody. Remember, I'm not trying to beat anybody. Remember, Jesus said, if you'll do this, I'll do it with you. I'll go with you. You won't do this alone. And so this disciple, the journey of the disciple is a never-ending process because my relationship with Christ, therefore, must become my most important relationship. Therefore, it's never arrived. But the other side of that, though, is while I'm on this journey of being a disciple, I will never stop being a disciple and growing and wanting to get better in my relationship with Christ. While I'm on the way... I need to become the discipler, the disciple maker. And I know this is where some people get all nervous and say, I don't, I don't think I know enough to make a disciple. I don't think I know enough to pass on. I, I, I don't think I'm ready. I don't think I'm mature enough. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. Spiritual maturity is not simply rooted in how much you know, how many Bible verses you can quote, how spiritual you are, how much Christianese you've learned. That's not spiritual maturity. Not, that's not spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity is the ability to reproduce. Physically or biologically, in plant life or animal life, something is technically mature when it can reproduce. Some of you look at me like, right. You're telling me a 14-year-old is mature enough to have a baby? Yes, I am if their body's matured. Now, are they emotionally mature enough? Are they financially mature enough? No. But is their body mature enough? Remember what God says, if you'll go bear fruit, if you'll go make disciples, I'll help you along the way. You won't do this alone. I don't know if I'm helping anybody. See, God's called, and a disciple maker is someone, a disciple is someone who follows. The disciple maker is someone mentors. And I'm telling you, you can start mentoring. You can start adding value to people's lives. You can start passing on what you're learning. You can start passing on your faith. And trust me, God will use it and God will honor it. So if I'm going to be a disciple maker, let's get into this a little bit. If I'm going to be a disciple maker, I've got to initiate the relationship. To make disciples, I have to be the initiator of the relationship. I know some of us were just waiting for relationships to come into our life. Some of us are just waiting for certain kind of friendships. No, no, no. The Bible teaches us that if I'm going to be a person who leaves a spiritual legacy, if I'm going to be a person who makes a spiritual difference in other people's lives, then I must be the initiator of the relationship. That requires faith. That requires courage. requires so many other things. But look what the scripture says here in Matthew chapter 4. It says, one day, As Jesus was walking along the shores, he's walking along, he's just going through life. The Sea of Galilee, he saw, he's walking, he sees, he's walking, he's looking, he's looking. Two brothers, Simon, who's called Peter, and Andrew, throwing a net into the water. For they fished for a living. Jesus called to them, come, follow me, and I will show you how to fish for people. 
Notice, Jesus initiated the relationship. And while Jesus is walking, he's looking. As he's walking, he's looking. Listen, as you're on your way to build your career, look. As you're on your way to build your family, look. As you're on your way to get your education, look. Don't stop looking for the people that God wants you to notice. Don't stop looking for the people, I'm going to say it again, that God wants you to notice. If you have a heart for God and you have a heart for the kingdom, I promise you, God wants to bring people into your life that you can be an answer to their prayer, that you can be an encouragement to them. You say, but I don't have a lot. Trust me, you have more than you realize because you have Jesus with you. And you can be the just-in-time disciple maker. You can be the person you don't know, you, just you showing up what you just meant to me. You, you just welcomed me. You prayed for me. You helped me. You did this for me. It was just in time. It was just what I needed, just what my marriage needed, just what my career needed, just what I needed in my walk with God. That's who you can be, the just in time. Many people don't know this, that Jesus said not once but twice, it is finished. They know the second time that we've heard that it's finished. When he hung on the cross and he died for our sins and he said it's finished. And I don't have to earn my salvation. I just have to receive it because of what Jesus did. But before Jesus went to the cross and said it's finished, in John 17, he said, Father, I have finished the work that you've given me to do. And then he starts talking about the disciples the men that God gave him and how he prayed for them and how he taught them and how he sanctified himself for them and all that he did for them. See, before Jesus went to the cross to die for our sin, he knew he needed a generation to pass the baton after he left. He goes, I'm giving you, I'm giving you the kingdom. I'm giving you my salvation, but I need somebody to pass the baton after I'm gone. And so he finished building a team before he went to the cross. I hope you hear this. God needs a team. God, before I walk off this planet, I want to make a difference in somebody else's life. God, before I walk off this planet, I want to pass the baton. I want to leave a spiritual legacy. I, I want to make a difference. Now, you might be wanting to make somebody in your, you might have a son or a daughter or a spouse in your mind, and you might be frustrated because they're blocked to you. They won't open to you. But it doesn't mean that there are not other people who are open to you. Is this making any sense? Just because one door is closed don't mean all your doors are closed. And just start walking through life, God. Every day, God, is there somebody today you want me to invest into? Is there somebody today you want me to impart into? Is there a just-in-time moment? Just-in-time moment. Jesus did two things when he gathered these people because he turned them into world changers. He did two things. He taught and he modeled. Modeling makes teaching come alive. I'm going to say it again. Jesus taught and he modeled. And teaching or modeling makes teaching come alive. And so I want to give you five quick things that Jesus did. Three habits and two character traits. I'm going to try to get through this. Somewhere. Three habits and two character traits. God wants you and I, when he says go and make disciples, really it's the work of the Holy Spirit to make a disciple. It's our work just to help get them going. It's like arrows in the hand of a warrior. We just get them aimed. We, get them some, we give people basic skills, basic tools to get them going scripture says it this way in philippians chapter one it says being confident of this that he who begun a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of jesus christ which simply means which simply means it's not my job to save you it's not my job to fix you it's not my job to rescue you. It's just my job to mentor you and pass on what I know to help you get started. And it's God's job after that to do all the heavy lifting. See, God's not asking you to be the Savior. Some of you should say, oh, praise the Lord, because you're not a very good one. Why don't we leave the saving to the Savior, and we'll just leave the discipling to you and let him finish the job. But to be able to help do this thing called discipleship, there has to be a rhythm of regularity. And in John chapter 3, in John chapter 3, it says, after this, Jesus and his disciples went out into the Judean countryside where he spent some time with them. The old King James will say he tarried with them, then he baptized them. That word tarry is the Greek word diatribo, and it simply means to rub off on them. How many know that sometimes if your children spend certain times with certain kids, when they come home, you can tell they've rubbed off on you. 
And sometimes it's not a good rubbing off. Sometimes it's a good rubbing off. It's like, I want you to spend more time with that kid and less time with that kid because they rub off on you. I was the kid when I was a teenager. I was the kid you did not want your kids to hang out with. I just want you to know that. It's like, do not spend any time with David. It's like, that's not the kid you wanted me to spend any time with because I did not rub off on people very well. But we do. We rub off on people. Have you ever noticed that? And Jesus, if we're going to disciple, we spend regularity with people. And Jesus took these outcasts, these fishermen, tax collectors, this range of people, and he rubbed off on them. And he moved them from being passive to passionate. He moved them from being indifferent to different makers because he spent time with them. He's imparting to them. And he taught them how to have a relationship with the Father. So I want to give you five quick things, as I mentioned. Now, listen carefully. I said it earlier. Discipleship making, becoming a disciple is a lifetime journey. But we don't often have a lifetime to make a disciple. In fact, most of the context of your life will be a short time. You won't have a long time. You'll have a short time. We as a church have a lot of military come in. And I was talking to somebody earlier, talking about how here at Capitol, our military comes in. Sometimes they're only here for a few months. By the time they find the church, yeah, I'll meet military. It's like, how long are you going to be at Lewis McCord? Year, two years, not very long. They're in and out. And in some churches, like, well, if you're going to be here so quick, we can't use you. We can't work with you because you're, you're not going to be around. Not, not us. It's like, okay, if you're going to be here six months, then I want to equip you with these five things I want to mention to you before you leave. Some of you, okay, change the context. Some of you are, are foster parents, which means the kid's only going to be with you for a short time. In the short time, here are some tools, basic tools to get them started. Then God can finish the work after that. If you just get the basic tools. Others of you are uh, uh, in divorced homes or step-parent homes where you live in other parts of the country and you only get certain amounts of time a year with your child, son, or daughter. In that little limited time, you can shape them just giving them some basic tools tools and these are the basic tools so so yes discipleship is a lifetime of learning but sometimes we only have a short term and if you have a short term these are the just in time things you want to deliver number one number one if you have if you have only time to teach one thing if you can only impose one thing teach them the habit of prayer scripture says pray continually prayer is simply communication Communication is simply talking to God. It's talking and listening. <coughs> Excuse me. You have to in, impress upon someone, like I'm impressing upon you, the importance of communication. Yes, I will pray for you, but you know what's more important than me praying for you? You pray for yourself. Far more important than me praying for you. See, trust me, how many parents have a child you're praying for? Wouldn't it be a relief if they started praying for themselves? Wouldn't the burden come off of you if they started praying for themselves? Like, oh, thank you, God. It's like I've went from tarrying and laboring and travail for you to worshiping and thanking God because you're praying for yourself now. Touchdown, pass the baton. We win. You're praying. I'm done. God bless. Come on, help me out here. Help me out here. Join the prayer army, prayer, just start talking to God. Let me ask you this question. You're emphasizing the important. Can any relationship be sustained, grow, and enhanced without communication? Can a marriage grow without communication? Can a friendship grow without communication? No. You're not going to grow in God unless you talk to God, unless you communicate with God. So, so emphasize the importance of prayer and then take it a step further. Model it. Teach it, then model it. Pray with them. I know I'm freaking some of you out now. Pray out loud. Some of you have the one person in the home that does all the praying. And while their head's down praying, everybody else is just looking around. No, 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 no. If you're the one that does all the praying, do you just say, I want you to pray today. Because pray, and pray out loud because it lets them hear how you pray. That's impartation. Let them hear how you talk to God. Let them hear how you address Him. Let them hear how you're grateful and thankful. And, and only if you have a short time because this is effectively passing the baton. Now, if you have more time, 
because you need a rhythm of regularity, if you have more time, then you can start teaching all kind of things about prayer. You can teach the Lord's Prayer. You can teach praying in the Spirit. You can teach confessions. You can teach suppl uh, supplications. You can, you can teach uh, uh, intercession. You can go on, pre praying the prayer, promises of God, praying through your identity. You can go on and on and on. It's, it's a massive subject. But just start, just talk to God. Just start there. Just, I don't care what you say. Just start talking to him. I don't know what to say. What would you say to a friend? Hey, what's up? I don't, just talk to him. Just talk to him. Begin there. Number two, second habit. The habit of, spend time with them. The habit of reading, studying, and discussing the word of God together. Help em emphasize to them the importance of God's word. The Bible says it this way in Hebrews chapter 12. It says, for the word of God is alive and active. Here's a couple of thoughts about the word. In other words, help them understand that the word of God is, it's alive. It's, it, it, it's, it's your strength. When you read God's word, you'll find yourself getting stronger. Scripture says that, that it, it, it's the bread of life. It's the food that we live on. And have you ever noticed your own self spiritually that when you don't read, you start feeling weak? But when you eat, you get stronger. Sometimes just reading the word, just meditating on it, studying the word just does something to your spirit. Just like you have a physical hunger your spirit needs to be fed and you feed it. It's reading God's word is spiritual food. But it goes on to say that it's sharper than any two-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit. Now watch this next part. Joints and marrow and as a judge of the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Not only is the word of God my food, the word of God is my mirror. How many would say you've read the word of God and all of a sudden it started convicting you of attitudes and different things and it started to address you? See, everybody needs a mirror. Have you ever had somebody says, if you looked in the mirror today, which is cute, like you need to go look in the mirror, probably need some adjusting. And the Word of God helps us adjust ourselves, But it also helps our, gives us guidance in our life. Look at this next passage of Scripture. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, it says, all Scripture is God-breathed. See, God's Word, God's Word, it's alive. If you will allow it, it will breathe on you. It will speak life to you. It will strengthen you. It also, it's like, oh, I need to make some adjustments. I need to make some changes. It's God breathed and is useful. It's useful. This is useful. It's useful. How, how, many, how many have a uh, owner's manual in your glove box in your car? It's useful. If you have to troubleshoot, it's useful. If something goes wrong, it's useful. It's useful. It, it, it's a bummer if it's not there. This is useful. God's word is useful. For teaching, for rebuking, for correcting, and training in it's training in righteousness. Go on, please. So that the servant of God, that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. God's word equips me. So, so get them in the habit of. The importance of God's word. And I think most of us would understand that. But here's what I'm trying to say. It's like, Pastor, I know this. I know you know this. If you're here in the summer on a beautiful day like today in the Northwest, you know this. I'm not telling you because you know this. I'm telling you for somebody who doesn't know this. Do you know sometimes you can have something precious that someone doesn't understand the value of it? I don't know if I'm making any sense. You have to teach the value of studying God's word. You have to have... Feed them. So where do you start? Because the Bible's, God, the Bible's so many different places in it. Help them to start in the New Testament because it introduces them to Jesus. And then when you can read the historical Bible, you can read di different parts of the history, you can read the laws, that'll get confusing. You can read the journey of the people of Israel. You can read stories of men and women of faith. There's just so much in there, and you can get lost. In fact, the Bible says there are people ever learning but never coming to the knowledge of the truth. So you want them to come to the knowledge of the truth. So as you're teaching and reading the scripture, so give them these three questions. Question number one, what, is, what, what you're reading, what is it asking you to be? Scripture will ask you to be holy, be kind, be patient, be long-suffering, be filled with the Spirit, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's a lot of bees, just be. 
be a human being. Be spiritually minded. Second question is, what is it asking me to do? It's asking me to go. Some of you are nervous about that. It's asking you to serve. It's asking you to be generous. It's asking you to pray. It's asking you to forgive. It's asking you to do all kind of things. So what is it asking you to do? What's it asking me to be? What's it asking me to do? Now this is getting to application. This is transformation here. Third question is, and what are you going to do? You now know what you're supposed to be. Come. You now know what you're supposed to do. What will you do? The habit of prayer and the habit of reading God's Word. But now it comes into the first character trait. So you have five things. Three are habits, two are character traits. Here's the first character trait. Third point, third character trait. Surrender. God resists the proud. Scripture says in James, listen to this, submit yourself to God. Submit yourself to God. This is the character trait. And I need you to understand this, really important. Prayer and Bible reading must be married, coupled, joined to the act of surrender for there to be transformation. There has to be this character trait of learning to surrender to what God's speaking to your heart. Learning to surrender to what the Word is teaching you. And it will scare you. It's scary. Help them understand. It's scary. I'm still scared. That's why it's a never-ending journey. It's like, God, see, to surrender means, God, I'm putting my faith in you, my trust in you. And sometimes he's going to ask me to give up some things. In my journey, I've had to give up some of my rights. I'm an American, God. It's like, I know, but now you're also a Christian. So you, so you get to give up some of your rights. I've had to give up some of my opinions. I've had to give up some of my attitude. I've had, to, I've had to give up some of my ways. I've had to give up some bitterness. God's going to say, I need you to surrender and let that go. But then he also turns around and says, but I want you to add some things to your life. I want you to <clears throat> make a commitment and get planted in my spiritual family. So I'm not going to make no commitment to a church. I don't, I don't want to make commitment. It's funny. People are funny. We don't want to make relational commitments, but we will go make a 30-year commitment to a mortgage. We will go make an eight-year commitment to a car, but I don't make no commitments. No, you just want to get into commitments that cause you bondage, but you don't want to make commitments that get you into growth. Now, you might want to take a, go back and look at the mirror. Go back and look at the mirror because you become what you commit to, and if you commit to being non-committed, you will produce a non-committed life. God will ask you to add some things to your life. I gotta learn to surrender. Here's here's habit. I gotta I gotta quickly move. Here's habit number three, point number four, the habit of building community. So if I just got a short time with someone, I need you to start talking to God. I need you to start reading His Word. I need you to surrender. But now I need you to make sure that you're getting involved in spiritual community because biblical community is powerful. It's life changing. It's life giving, and it is absolutely essential for growth. We do not grow spiritually in a vacuum. Yes, I can have moments with God, but I am called to be alone, but I'm also called to be together. And we all, listen carefully, we all need the right relationships influencing our life if I want to grow spiritually. I got to have them. Scripture says in Hebrews, what's this verse? Hebrews Chapter 10 says, and let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Do you do that? Do you do that? You should, if you get a disciple, you'll start doing that. All week long I'm sitting there thinking, how can I spur you on to love and good deeds? I mean, I do, I I sit there, I spend hours thinking about how I can try to spur you on, encourage you in the way you should go. Towards love and good deeds. That's what we're going to do today. We're going to do a good deed today. We're doing something good today. Not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But encouraging one another all the more as you see the day approaching. COVID happened. And COVID interrupted many people's community. But COVID is over. Sometimes when habits get a changed, bad habits get picked up. 
it's time to pick up the good habits again. Because listen carefully, if I don't have the right relationships in my life holding me accountable, if I don't have the right relationships holding me accountable, I will go from a pass, passionate Christian back to a passive one. I'll go from being a Christian who's making a difference to a Christian who's no longer I'm becoming indifferent. I'll move from having a cause in my life to becoming casual. You need that father, that mother, that mentor, that encourager in your life. Because when I do, when I worship together and I pray together, we start loving one another and we start bearing one another's burdens. And now I get to be loved while I learn to love. I get to be known while I learn to know. I get to be forgiven while I learn to forgive. I start doing this thing called biblical community. And it brings me to my last point. And that's the second trait. Humility. The trait of humility. Humility enhances relationship. A lack of humility hinders relationships. And when you and I practice this trait of humility, it brings God's favor. It's simply saying, God, I need you. It's a character trait. I've seen this so many times. I've seen people come to God and their world is blown up. They're in crisis. The world's caving in on them. It's like, God, I need your help. I need your help. I need your help. And God steps in and rescues them. But then they go from that weakness to strength. And all of a sudden, I got it now, God. They go from brokenness to being put together. I got it now, God. Can I, can I teach you something? That when you're in the pit, you know that you need a God. When you're on the mountaintop, see, I've learned, it scares me. When, 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 when I'm in the places of the greatest success and the greatest peace and things are going really well, it's like, God, don't let me be deceived in this moment. Because nothing's changed. Just the comfort of my life. That's the only thing changed. Because whether I'm hurting or comfortable, I need you every day. Every situation and every moment. My need for you does not change because I've gotten more comfortable. In fact, God, the fact that I'm more comfortable makes me more dependent and desperate to make sure I'm staying dependent upon you, God. Don't let me get lukewarm. In my comfort, let me be the disciple that understands I need to stay humbly depending upon my God. If you pass those five things on, you'll get the ball rolling. Holy Spirit can take over from there, and people can go and run a great race in Christ. Hey, stand to your feet. We're going to go back into worship. Now listen carefully. If you're here and you need prayer, I'm going to have some of the pastors. We're going to pray for you. If you want, if you need sickness, heal for sickness in your body, you're, you're believing for something going on in your marriage, or, or you're just needing that, I, I need to depend on God, or you need anything. There's going to be some of our team that's going to be just up in front as we go back into this worship. I just want to pray for you. But Father, I speak over your people. I speak over those watching online that you're accomplishing your will. That God, that we are living on mission. We're fulfilling our assignment to go and make disciples. Father, I trust your grace and your mercy in the beautiful name of Jesus. Let's worship, church.